Thank you all for joining today's teacher's workshop, U.S.-China Relations Coexistence in a Changing World. It is so exciting to know that we have individuals joining in from 29 states and also internationally. A very good morning to you. Thank you also to Asia Society Center on U.S.-China Relations for co-sponsoring this event, to Mary Kay Magstad, its Deputy Director for her dual role in this workshop, to Robert Daly, Director of the Kissinger Institute, and David Feierstein, President and CEO of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for their insights. My name is Susanna Liu Hedberg. I'm the Executive Director of the 1990 Institute. We are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to champion fair and equitable treatment for Asian Americans and a constructive US-China relationship. We primarily work to support and empower teachers in the implementation of Asian American Pacific Islander or ethnic studies. As many of you may know, by 2025, a majority of states will mandate the teaching of AAPI or ethnic studies. There are over 20 states right now with legislation passed or pending, and additional 20 states have some statute or mechanism in place whereby AAPI or ethnic studies will be offered as an elective. This is a real win that we can bridge and broaden cultural understanding while also allowing the next generation of AAPI students to see themselves represented. But there's so much left to do. Getting legislation passed is one thing, being able to teach it effectively is another. So 1990 supports teachers through creating content like short form videos that are cliffs notes or spark notes in boning up on sometimes unfamiliar topics. We also convene teachers so they can learn from and strategize with other schools and districts within and in other states. And finally, we organize teachers workshops like today's where we invite academics and experts to provide context and historical and cultural insight to incorporate into everyday lesson plans and curriculum. At 1990 Institute, we've had a long history of bridging mutual understanding between US and China, and we have recognized that after seeing some statistics from Pew and other research centers about the American public opinion on China and the competition narratives that permeate mainstream media, that increasing the awareness of, benefits, um, of the benefits of a constructive US-China relationship yields better Asian American safety and equity. So before diving in, We'd like to do a quick poll to know, what are your views on China coming into this workshop? And while you're completing the poll, I'd like to introduce Mary Kay Magstad, who has been a speaker at 1990's Past Teachers Workshops since its launch in 2013. And we are grateful for her continued support here today. She's the Deputy Director of Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations and an award-winning journalist who lived and reported in East Asia for more than two decades, including NPR, PRX's The World, The Washington Post, among others. In addition to these accolades, she supported the 1990 Institute um, as, as well and has taught internationally and created well-known, uh, po recognized podcasts like On China's New Silk Road, Whose Century Is It?, and Colonize. Mary Kay, over to you. Thank you all for being here. Um, we meet at a, a challenging moment for the for US-China relations, a sometimes fraught moment, um, when the question that keeps coming up is how do these two great powers coexist without conflict? You know, how much can they cooperate? How much do they compete? You know, where is the middle ground where we can avoid what ultimately would not be good for either? great power or for the world. And then in the midst of answering that question, or at least thinking about it, because I think it's one we'll be grappling about for quite a long time, what difference does it make that China is dealing with increasing challenges at home, that its economy, its economic growth is slowing, its population is aging, um, its workforce is contracting, but even at the same time, uh, there are a lot of young people in China who are unemployed, who went through the university system, had great expectations for what their lives might be like and maybe aren't quite finding the match in the economy right now. And, but at the same time, their ambitions, their personal ambitions and China's ambitions remain. And in that moment, how does the United States work with China, work with individual Chinese to help them attain at least some of their ambitions, 
um, to show that there's room in the world for both of us. To help us think, both of us, the chi China and the United States, but also Chinese and Americans and everyone else. To help us think about the challenges that these questions present, um, we have two uh, extraordinary panelists, um, and I will be saying a few words after they speak. I'm going to introduce them in reverse order um, so that I can then throw directly to our first speaker after uh, the introductions. So David Firestein is the inaugural president and CEO of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. He's a decorated former U.S. diplomat and a fluent Chinese speaker with 18 years in the U.S. Foreign Service, specializing primarily in U.S.-China relations. During his diplomatic career, he won the Secretary of State's Award for Public Outreach and Linguist of the Year Award. In the years since his diplomatic career, David has served as Senior Vice President and Perot Fellow at the East-West Institute in New York, where he led the Institute's Track II diplomacy work in the areas of U.S.-China relations, East Asian uh, security, and U.S.-Russian relations, U.S.-Russia relations. He also speaks Russian, by the way. Uh, and he was the founding executive director of the University of Texas at Austin's China Public Policy Center and a clinical professor at that university's Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. David has written or co-written three books on China, including two that were published in China and were Chinese language bestsellers. Um, he's also written many monographs, articles, and policy reports. Um, early in his career, he interpreted for dozens of top-level U.S. and Chinese leaders and officials. Our other panelist, Robert Daly, um, has for a decade directed the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He's, he is, uh, in addition to that, a member of the Task Force on U.S.-China Policy, which is co-led by Asia Society's Center on U.S.-China Relations, for which I'm deputy director, and UC, the University of California at San Diego's 21st Century China Center. Uh, Robert has been a US diplomat in Beijing. He too has interpreted for senior US and Chinese leaders for President Jimmy Carter, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, and also for China's president in the 1990s and early 2000s, Jiang Zemin, and for Li Yunchao, who was China's vice president 2013 to 2018. Robert was a cultural exchange officer at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing in the late 1980s and early 90s. He lived in China for 11 years um, and followed his diplomatic service with helping to produce Chinese language versions of Sesame Street and working on television and theater projects in China as a host, actor, and writer and directing the Syracuse University China Seminar. Um, Robert has also been the American director of the Johns Hopkins University Nanjing University Center for Chinese and American Studies in Nanjing. Robert, over to you to kick us off with thoughts about um, the history of this relationship and where we are now. Well, thank you, Mary Kay. It's very good to be working with you and with David and very happy to be with the 1990 Institute and to support your important mission. And if we are doing anything today to help the teachers out there, then I'm, I'm really delighted. That's just very important work and best of luck to all of you in that. I'm gonna give just a, a really a thumbnail sketch of a very complicated issue, uh, US-China relations, how we got uh, to where we are today and sort of the way to, to frame the relationship now and think about it. Uh, I think that the big story since relations were formed in 1979, the overwhelming story transformed the world is really one of China's success. Uh, it's economic success, 850 million people out of absolute poverty, but it's technological success. It's now uh, arguably the second greatest technological nation in the world, and it's number one in a growing number of categories. It's educational success. Mary Kay mentioned that a number of young a very high percentage of young Chinese are now unemployed. But behind that story is the incredible expansion of Chinese universities uh, from a very low baseline after the Cultural Revolution. And they now get so, so many of their young people into new universities that they have this unemployment problem. But I say there's a wonderful success behind that. China has greatly improved the health outcomes of its people, their general well-being. Uh, and even up until, and we can we can argue about this, but about until 2013, uh, since the U.S. and China established relations in 79, 
the personal freedoms of most Chinese have also steadily improved. And I think that it's, it's safe to say that again, about 2013, that, that was probably the best time in Chinese history to be a citizen of China, even from the point of view of personal freedom, which fell far short of the standards that we hold ourselves to. But it was nevertheless a record of incredible progress. Uh, and the thumbnail sketch of China's modern history is, is offered by Xi Jinping himself, the current leader, who said that under Mao Zedong, China stood up, meaning that it regained its sovereignty and it kicked out the foreigners. He said, so under Mao, we stood up. Under Deng Xiaoping, China developed or got rich. And now, Xi Jinping by now means under me, China is moving toward center stage in world affairs. And as one sentence summary, that's really rather hard to argue with. I think that that is... Uh, that is roughly correct. But we also need to note that China's victorious march uh, since Deng Xiaoping began reform and opening up was preceded by a historic failure of the Chinese nation. Uh, China now describes this not as a failure, but as a humiliation, what they call the century of humiliation from the Opium War until 1949. Uh, and it certainly was a humiliating period for China. But it was a humiliation that was made possible by the weakness, poverty, and backwardness of a nation that had been, for about 2,000 years, the most accomplished on earth uh, by really any measure. During China's century of humiliation, I think it's worth noting that many of, you, many of China's own critics uh, put the blame for China's weakness, its fall from glory, on China itself. A lot of that historical discourse has, has been uh, ignored under Xi Jinping. So what do we have in China? We have a story of China's greatness, historical greatness, uncontested and really unmatched. Then a fall, a rise, and now a tantalizingly close return to glory uh, for China. And China's modern story is also a story of incredible change. And like David and like Mary Kay, having lived through most of this, or good, a good deal of it since 1980, uh, it's the story of tr the tremendous adaptability and hard work of the Chinese people. You know, we tend to think of China as being tradition bound, and in many ways that's true. Uh, but they've proven themselves also to be extraordinarily adaptable, and in my view, in many ways more adaptable uh, than we. So, in the main, this is China's story. The story of China's rise is China's story. But the United States has also played a considerable part in it. And I want to run through that the way that China after the opening of relations in 79, China recognizing its backwardness uh, began a period of uh, tutelage in many ways, not only to the United States, but to Japan and much, much of Europe. Um, and we forget now that we speak often of, of Chinese arrogance, uh, really how very humble China's tutelage was and how impressive China's willingness to learn from other countries was. China has been a great student and observer of United, the United States military, economic, political, and cultural power. But it has also been gradually disabused of a lot of its more positive views of the United States. I'd like to walk that through you, through, walk you through that briefly to give you a sense of the way that China uh, has looked at us. And obviously when I say that, uh, it's dangerous to, it sounds as though all Chinese look at us the same way. That of course, is not true. 1.4 billion people, many different views. The Chinese say Lin Da Yo. It's a big forest, got all kinds of birds. And that's true in China. So we're dealing in broad strokes using phrases like China, the Chinese. Um, it's reductionist. Uh, forgive me, but I'm going to proceed along those lines so that we can make a few points. Um, so Set 1979, the relationship was relaunched under Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping, and there was sort of a, a, a decade, a golden decade, a very idealistic decade. I don't know, Mary Kay, when you first got there. I know David was there in this period. I was there in this period. Uh, and this ends in 1989 with the Tiananmen Massacre, which changes Beijing's views, the, the Beijing government's views of its own people. It changes United States views of, of China uh, quite foundationally, and it starts... Uh, a, a new process of falling out of love between the two countries. 1990, the first Gulf War, I watched this from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. The Chinese watched what we did in Kuwait, and they were astounded and rather terrified because 
like most Americans at the time, they had no idea what modern warfare had become. And they realized that they had no answer for this at all. And they began trying to modernize the PLA. Then in 1991, we had the collapse of the USSR and the end of the Cold War, which raised questions in China's mind about how durable communist states were. China's governance is modeled on that of the Soviet Union. In 1995, just very briefly, there was a Taiwan Strait crisis in which the Clinton administration sent two aircraft carrier battle groups to the region around Taiwan in order to intimidate China. And China was duly intimidated. They had to back down and they had no answer for this, but they doubled down in their determination that they would not be in this position again, uh, especially on their own doorstep. In 1997, with the Asian financial crisis, uh, China began to sense the powers of its leadership, uh, even in the financial realm, where it helped to stabilize that crisis. Um, in 2001, of course, we had 9-11, followed by the forever wars, which started to teach China lessons about America's military invincibility. We were not all powerful. They had been studying our military, and they started to learn uh, not only about our power, but about our weakness. In 2003, we had the Georgian Rose Revolution. In 2004, the Ukrainian Orange Revolution. And China, like Russia, sees the United States as fomenting color revolutions to overthrow them. This was a major point at which China was learning lessons. Then with the global financial crisis in 2008, China, having learned about American military weakness, learns about American financial and economic weakness. We do not have all of the answers. Um, then with 2016 and the Donald Trump election, China begins to see American political, cultural weakness, the weakness of our democratic institutions, uh, the weakness of what we had been, David and I, when we were in the United States Information Agency, uh, telling the Chinese was sort of the, the, the bedrock of, of the United States. And they started to think maybe that rock uh, had some gelatinous characteristics to it. Uh, they then watched our failed COVID response uh, initially. And then more recently, they were very disappointed to see uh, President Biden more or less continuing the tenets of the Trump administration's uh, China policy. So where are we today? I argue, and this is now my very much a, a subjective point of view, there's, there's a very healthy and interesting debate about this. But my view is that the best analytic framework for really understanding everything that you're reading about in US-China relations uh, is that this is, in fact, a new Cold War. Saying that gives me no pleasure. I'm not a hawk who's been dying to say that. I have been an engager par excellence. I say Sesame Street to China. I was in soap operas. I was in stage plays. Uh, I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to China in almost all aspects of my life. So it's not that I can finally declare a Cold War. No, the fact that this is a new Cold War is a tragedy. Uh, it should have been avoidable but we jointly didn't avoid it. And when I say that it's a new Cold War, I do mean to imply that it is going to be as long, as dangerous, as costly, and as sinfully wasteful as the first one. I won't give you the whole uh, reason that I have for calling it a Cold War. I would only note, and if you have this discussion with your students, please teach them to be more careful about using martial metaphors than Washington is. But I'm going to use some martial metaphors. You know, we are very comfortable saying that we are in a trade war, that we are in a tech war. The military, our military now calls China its pacing challenge. So we have a new arms race, which includes nukes, includes a true um, strategic dilemma in the Western Pacific and a potential flashpoint in Taiwan, the return of mutual assured destruction, something that your students are going to have to understand. We have both countries forming what are emerging as blocks building up alliances and quasi-alliances. We have President Bush, I'm sorry, Biden, saying that this is a global battle between democracy and authoritarianism. I happen to think that formulation is wrong, but that's the ideology piece. Both countries are overtly competing to shape global order. There's that piece. And uh, as was discussed in, in some of the opening uh, information, if you look at public opinion polling, the peoples of these two countries are more alienated from each other. So if we've got a trade war, a tech war, a nuclear arms race, new blocks, ideological competition, global order competition, and alienation, tell me how this is not a Cold War. I understand that saying that is depressing and retrograde, and we thought we were better than that, and we're not. But I think that that 
uh, is now where we are, and that's the best way to understand it. Against this background, what does China want? When you ask China this question, it begins, uh, I think quite reasonably, by talking about its legitimate interests, which need to be respected. China will say we, it has a right to sovereignty, including sovereign territory, but also the right to pick its own system of governance. It points out that it has a right to develop. Any Chinese government, even if it were a liberal democracy, would have to import enormous amounts of food, energy, and natural resources. It would have to have access to foreign markets and foreign ideas, meaning China has a right to participate. China also would say, again, I think accurately, that it has a right to security, including a growing say in regional defense architectures. This is very reasonable. And China also says that it has a right to help shape global order. Um, so what China seeks against this background to get all these goods is what it calls comprehensive national power. What does it mean by that? It means really a version of what we've had since World War II. As I said, China has been a student of and has felt subject to American power since the end of World War II. And its view now is, yeah, let's try that on for size. We'll take the soft power, the economic power, the normative power, the political power, uh, the whole shebang. That is what comprehensive national power is what China wants. What it is trying to figure out, and this is very tricky, is how do you translate wealth into power? How does that happen? There have been some economists within China itself for the past 20 years who have spoken as though when China's annual GDP exceeds that of the United States, the U.S. just sort of says, okay, and hands over the keys to the bus. But of course, that's not how this is going to work. How, how does China's trying to figure out how do you translate wealth into influence? Um, so just I'll, 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 I'll wrap up. We've got two more minutes. Uh, a few of the problems that China faces. China's rise has been more rapid and broader in scope than any rise in human history. It's an extraordinary accomplishment. But China rises late. It rises in a world in which every space on the geographic chessboard is already occupied by a sovereign nation state. So unlike the European powers when they rose, the United States with Manifest Destiny and the Monroe Doctrine, Japan when it rose, China faces, faces a world in which there's very little space. It feels boxed in. It also feels boxed in by normative space, which is to say that there is a body of international law which is incomplete evolving, contested, many problems with it. But the notions about what constitutes fairness and the notion about what a law should be is out there already. And China doesn't have a, a say about that. So when Xi Jinping says that he's going to move China towards center stage, China didn't build that stage. That stage, the notion of what it means to be a responsible global leader uh, is already out there. And, and again, China didn't set it up. Um, most of the world expects a global leader uh, to support a system which, broadly speaking, works for everybody, to pay costs, to provide goods, uh, to get involved in a way that China isn't yet quite ready to do, to preserve the system as such. That's what responsible powers do. So China faces a lot of difficulties with that. The goal of Chinese foreign power, uh, foreign policy today, uh, I think the, the best way to think about it is that China seeks to build deference through dependence, to leverage its wealth, to build influence. But notice I said deference, not dominance. This notion that China wants to rule the world. No, it doesn't. China is out for China. The truth is China doesn't care enough about the rest of the world to want to rule it or take on its problems. China just wants to get from it what it needs for China. And it wants to get those things without obstacle and without objection. In this, China cannot succeed. So we'll see how it goes. I'll stop there. Thank you, Robert. That was a great summary of, of uh, recent history leading up to this moment. Um, David, over to you. Uh, Mary Kay, thank you so much. And uh, Susanna, thank you. And thanks to the 1990 Institute. I'm a big fan of the work that y'all do. It's very much needed, I think, now more than ever before. And it's a privilege to be with, uh, with Robert, with all of you, to, to talk about some very important topics uh, that relate to the future of our nation and the future of our people and the future of the world. Um, we're time limited, so um, I'll try to be as disciplined as, as Robert was in terms of keeping my remarks to about 15 minutes. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about 
some of the underlying deeper Im impediments to any qualitative improvement in U.S.-China relations uh, anytime in the foreseeable future and what that means for where this relationship is going and for our nation. Um, we often read in the headlines that there is a controversy around policy topic A or policy topic B or issue C or issue D. But the point that I often make is that the disagreements between the United States and China that exist and that are very real go much deeper than particular issues. Oftentimes, the disagreement around issues is really a manifestation of much deeper currents in the relationship. And I want to just say a few words about that. Um, there are a bunch of things that we don't often talk about that I think contribute to a kind of structural tension that will always exist between the in the relationship between these two countries. Uh, there's a structural element, which I'll say a couple of words about. There is a civilizational and cultural element and source of mistrust. There is ideology, which Robert uh, alluded to. There's doctrine, foreign policy doctrine. I'll say a word or two about that. There are political considerations. There is national psychology. And just parenthetically, I would note that um, I'm a big believer in the idea of diplomacy as psychology. And you can probably learn as much about diplomacy through the writings of Freud as you can through the writings of anybody else, because so much of it is about national personas and national identities. And then there's stylistic differences and discursive differences where we act and speak in our own ways. And sometimes that engenders mistrust and misunderstanding. And then there's an interesting issue of factuality, which I'll talk about a little bit. So I'm not going to drill down in all of these areas. But the point that I want to make is that beneath the surface of the issue of Taiwan, beneath the surface of the issue of the South China Sea or the East China Sea or human rights or Xinjiang, or Hong Kong, or the role of the state in the economy and trade, under all of that is a very complex set of uh, dynamics that really drive the relationship to a place of tension that I think is going to be with us for as long as I think any of us are alive. Let me say a couple of words about just some of these to kind of illustrate the points, and this is not an exhaustive list, but let me talk about the structural element very briefly. Um, what I mean by structural is that there's something inherent to the United States and China that complicates our relationship. And very simply put, it's that each country can do devastating harm to the other. And, and I don't just mean that in the sense of nuclear annihilation. Both countries are nuclear weapon states, as Robert mentioned, and both have intercontinental reach, and both can destroy the other. That is true. But that's not the sense of the term in which I'm using it. Viewed through a Chinese lens, the United States is really the only country in the world that has the capacity and possibly the intention to terminate Communist Party rule on the mainland once and for all. Um, that's how China sees the United States, uh, underneath the surface, underneath diplomatic niceties, uh, underneath the notion of talking about cooperation. China recognizes that there is a primal fear around the capabilities of the United States. Viewed through a U.S. lens, China is really the only country in the world that realistically can fundamentally alter our quality of life and our way of life for the worse, for the long haul, mostly through the economy, mostly through technology, and mostly through um, you know, what the economy means to our societies as we go forward in future decades. In China, there certainly is a widespread perception that China, more than any other country, can have a negative impact on our economic life and on our life more generally. Those two things are never going away. Both of those perceptions uh, in each direction generate a, what I call a primal fear or angst that is structural and that will never go away. When I talk about doctrinal differences, uh, and this is just another example I want to note, there is a profound irreconcilability to the doctrines, the foreign policy doctrines of the United States and China. Um, to put it very simply, the United States and our national security uh, strategies, going back quite some years, uh, posits that the United States aspires to primacy and supremacy. We say that. We actually say that's what we want. We want to be number one. We want to be the biggest, baddest, toughest, most influential player in the world that can impose our will on anyone at any time. That is what we say explicitly and in writing that we want. And China has a very different uh, doctrine. At a minimum, one can characterize China's doctrine as the idea of multipolarity. 
uh, arguably, it's the idea of be moving closer and closer toward the center of the world stage, as Robert mentioned, and arguably occupying the center of the world stage in the view of some. But at a minimum, it's an idea of multipolarity, which means that each pole player, the United States, China, Europe as a whole, arguably Russia, Japan, perhaps India, is co-equal to the other. So to put it very simply, from a doctrinal standpoint, the United States wants to be number one, and China doesn't want to be number two. And that is irreconcilable, and that will never go away because neither country will ever stop wanting what we want. So there's a doctrinal tension that is profound and that colors the relationship in very deep ways. I want to say a word or two about the politics, and it's particularly true in our system because of the nature of our system in which elected leaders feel like they either need to be responsive to an electorate or need to be perceived as being responsive to an electorate. And as a result, the politics of China and the United States have driven our policy to an extreme fringe that is not where our policy has historically been under presidents, uh, both Democratic and Republican, going back from Barack Obama all the way back to Richard Nixon. And now we're in a different place because the perception among the political class in the United States is that there is a political imperative to race to the toughest extreme possible. Uh, both through words, through legislation, through proposed legislation, through other symbolic acts. And it creates this race toward vitriol and ultimately uh, toward extraordinarily uh, extreme policies. Um, you know, it reminds me of the line that we've all heard, how do you know when so-and-so is lying when his lips are moving? And the way that I would say it, uh, based on what I'm seeing in our political um, arena right now, is according to this group, according to official Washington that views China in this way, how do you know that China is doing something bad when it's doing something? <laughs> if China's doing it, it's bad by definition. The very fact that China's doing it is in itself proof that the intention is nefarious, sinister, and basically designed to hurt America and hurt much the rest of the world. That is the mindset that exists. And uh, it has colored the way that American political leaders speak about China and colored the way that we approach China as a nation from the standpoint of legislation and policy. Um, and the point that I would make before uh, talking a little bit about the theme of factuality and then moving on uh, to a couple of other points that I want to make before I conclude um, is that what we see coming out of Washington, and it's on both sides of the partisan aisle at this point, uh, it started on one side, now it's pretty much a bipartisan effort. And Robert rightly alluded to the fact that the Biden administration's approach to China in many respects, many significant respects, is essentially a fifth year and sixth year of the Trump administration policies toward China, um, whether it's with respect to tariffs or other areas as well. In some cases, it's even more extreme. But the point that I would make is much of U.S. policy is focused on how do we drag China down? And the point that I often make to audiences across the country is if the U.S. political class spent 1 20th or 1 50th the amount of time trying to solve our nation's problems rather than trying to hold China back, we would actually be in a better position and be more able to outcompete China, which should be our nation's goal, and than we are at present by simply focusing on our competitor. Um, the last point that I want to make is about the issue of factuality. It sounds like a weird thing to talk about, but the point that I want to make is that um, factuality has now become a very pronounced and problematic uh, dynamic uh, in the relationship. And what I mean is three specific things. Number one, oftentimes the United States and China literally do not agree on what constitutes the facts around any particular issue. So something that we state as fact, and I mean as empirical fact, not as an opinion, China regards as a, an absolute falsehood. And things that China states as an empirical documentable fact, we regard as self-evidently false. So we don't agree on the facts. That's the first dynamic around factuality. The second that stems from that is that we, the United States and China, tend to gaslight each other fairly often in our communications to each other. And that has a deleterious and corrosive effect on mutual trust. And I'll talk about that more in a second. And third, 
and this is probably the most problematic from my standpoint, uh, we in both countries, but I would say part speaking particularly about the United States, we have seen uh, an incredible divorce between our discourse and factual reality in a whole range of areas in our national discourse. And that includes in our discourse around China. So let me just say a couple of things about these. Um, when I talk about uh, not agreeing on the facts, if you look at a case like the South China Sea, for example, China will uh, point to certain facts that it believes uh, uh, makes the case that, that you know, China's South China Sea claims are valid and are lawful. The United States will point to other facts, other things that are in documented international law, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and so on, that makes it clear that, and many others would agree, that China's claims lack validity. But we're bo both pointing to factual or ostensibly factual foundations, and we don't see the facts the same way. There are many other examples of that uh, with respect to COVID-19 and its origins and China's early handling of COVID-19, and the list goes on. Um, second point, the notion of gaslighting each other. Uh, we do it a lot. You know, when the United States says to China, and when I'm here, I'll pick up on the point Robert made. When I say the United States, I mean the U.S. executive branch and the U.S. authorities. And when I say China, I'm principally referring to the Chinese uh, powers that be in the Chinese government. When the United States says to China that our policy regarding and toward Taiwan has not changed at all, ever, uh, since its inception several decades ago, it's just not true. It has changed. It's changed in very specific and appreciable ways. I would argue uh, that it's changed in some pretty fundamental ways. But for us to say our policy remains unchanged, which is what we say, is false. And we know it's not true, and China knows it's not true. Uh, but when China says we have no human rights abuses in China, we're not doing a single thing wrong in Xinjiang, we're not uh, you know, um, infringing on the human rights of individuals on the basis of their political views and so on and so forth. They say that and it's false. It's not true. It's not the reality. And I think China at some level understands that and we understand it. So one of the things that we see is that we literally gaslight each other and say things to each other that, that all of us know aren't true. And that has a very corrosive impact uh, on the issue of trust. Um, so the two points that I would uh, make with respect to this set of issues before taking the last couple of minutes to make a few final points is that um, if we can't even agree on what constitutes the factual foundation for the various issues that we take up, uh, if we can't speak to each other honestly and tell the truth to each other and, and, and ground our discourse in factuality, then what hope really does the United States and, and do the United States and China have of solving some of the most complex issues on our bilateral agenda? And more fundamentally, I would make this point to um, our friends across the United States who are teaching and doing such important work on the front lines of educating our youth. The gravest danger, in my judgment, that we face in this country is the untethering of America's political and public discourse from factual reality. Unless and until we fix that, we will never outcompete China. But much more fundamentally, we will never solve our nation's own problems. So we've got to retether our discourse to factual reality and get out of la la land and the world of alternative facts and back to a place where even if we disagree on interpretations or opinions, we are operating on the same basis uh, of, of facts. The last thing I want to say um, in the remaining time I have is that most of the issues in the U.S.-China relationship are actually irreconcilable. We will never agree. We will never agree. As long as the two countries exist in their current states, the People's Republic of China, the United States of America, we will never agree on Taiwan, on the South China Sea, or the validity of China's claims there. We will never agree about human rights. We will never agree about what is happening in Xinjiang or what's happening in Hong Kong. We won't agree on the degree that's appropriate for a state uh, to be involved in a national economy or in international trade, and the list goes on and on. So the question is, what does that irreconcilability mean for the relationship, and what should it mean? I think that's the fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves. The last thing I would say is we've got to get back to the basic values and principles that undergirded our success in the first place. We used to be a country that believed in free trade, that believed in the free market, that the, believed that the, the U.S. government should play a limited role in commerce, not an expansive and intrusive role. 
we believed that we needed to focus on ourselves and enhance our own capable uh, 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 competitive capabilities. And we believed that we need to tell the truth. And we've gotten away from a lot of those things in our country. If we don't get back to those things, all of us might want to start learning Chinese. But if we do get back to the values that made us the number one economy in the history of the world, and one of the most powerful nations, and indeed the most powerful in the history of the world, if we get back to what brought us to where we are today, then I think we can compete more effectively, win more often, and give our kids the U.S.-China relationship and the future that they deserve. Thank you. Thanks, David, for that very rich and thought-provoking analysis. I'm going to round this out before turning to um, our conversation and opening this up to questions from you, which you can drop into the Q&A box right now. And I can look at them um, on the other side of this and bring you into this conversation. Um, I'm going to start with sort of a, a bit of a personal uh, story. You know, it, it's been said that that we are the stories we tell ourselves. Um, that's true in many ways, including when it comes to U.S. perceptions of China and Chinese perceptions of the United States. As a journalist in China over 15 years, um, I contributed to the stories that Americans heard from China. I opened NPR's bureau in 1996. I was there until 2013 with a short break in the middle. My approach as a correspondent in China was to travel to every province, usually multiple times, talk to the widest possible range of people I could, from farmers and workers in rural villages to artists, writers, academics, entrepreneurs, and officials at every level, from village level to cities, from local government to national. Um, I was on the road about a third of the time, and when I was home in Beijing, I talked with a pretty wide range of people every day there, too sometimes for interviews, more often just in informal interactions, and, and I learned from every single one of them. Besides that, I followed state-run media and what was then the increasingly lively Chinese social media scene. I also, during the first decade of the 2000s, followed the work of some pretty, pretty rigorous Chinese journalists who were doing you know, investigative and explanatory reporting that was worth paying attention to. All of this contributed contributed to the stories I told Americans about China. And I would say that in doing this amount of on the ground reporting, I was pretty typical of American and European journalists who were living in and covering China at that time. Most of the journalists I knew spoke Chinese and were genuinely interested in Chinese history and culture, as well as in you know, politics, economics, and business in China's extraordinary economic rise that you've heard uh, David and Robert talk about, and in the technocratic competence, more often than not, of the government that was overseeing that rise and giving credit where it was due on that count. I mention all this by way of saying that to the best of my own knowledge and experience, the typical international correspondent in China back then in the mid-1990s to 2013 didn't come in with an ax to grind and didn't come in with a, pre, with a consciously preconceived story to tell. However, as is the case with all of us in how we approach things in our lives, new experiences, everyone comes in with their own life experience, with their own perceptions, and sometimes misperceptions, in this case of China, those were reshaped by experience on the ground. And in those years, in the late 90s to you know when I left in 2013, that was a pretty great time to be a China correspondent. We could travel fairly easily. People would talk to us. Government officials would at least sometimes talk to us. And, and many held not infrequent press conferences or even offered press trips for foreign journalists, which yes, spun a certain narrative. Um, but it, I still felt that on occasion, at least, it was worth going on those trips um, you know, that were very organized down to the last detail um, to listen to what the stories the government was telling, what they wanted us to hear, and to compare that to what we saw on the ground in our own independent reporting. Sometimes the two matched, sometimes they didn't. But in either case, foreign journalists could quote government officials in their stories, they had the access, and the stories were better for having those multiple views and voices. Um, some of the stories that were told a lot when I first landed in China in the in the mid 90s, there was a big focus on human rights. There was still a bit of a, a hangover from the Tiananmen crackdown, so that was an ongoing focus. Um, there was an increasing 
focus on the trade talks that led to China entering the WTO. And along the way, there was a fair bit of focus on intellectual property theft and other trade issues. By the early 2000s, the narrative had shifted. There was much more business reporting. There was more focus on the impact of China's rapid economic growth. And I noticed that US sentiment toward China was becoming more positive. I also noticed, and this was just sort of an interesting thing that you know sunk in over time, that the narratives in the United States about China seemed to lag by two or three years what I was seeing on the ground in China and even what I and, and my colleagues were reporting. So it took a while to shift the narrative. And I think even in this moment now, it's gonna take a while to shift the narrative from what it is and, and has been in recent months and years. Um, so, you know, early 2000s, the, the narrative was becoming more positive, increasingly tinged with anxiety about how China was going to eat our lunch. Um, that narrative seemed to peak during and in the five years immediately after the Olympics. Um, that was a time when Chinese social media was becoming an even more interesting public square, despite Chinese censors and government paid commenters trying to control the conversation, thanks to coded language, clever puns and plays on known historical tropes standing in for actual political criticism of those in power. So then along came Xi Jinping stepping in as head of the Communist Party in late 2012, president of China in 2013. He was markedly less interested than his predecessors had been in using a charm offensive on foreign journalists or including them in press trips or even having press conferences. His approach has generally been one of uh, to, his his approach toward the foreign media has generally been one of defensive suspicion and of reducing ac access and even of telling Chinese people increasingly through state run media that foreign journalists might be spies, so they should be careful of them uh, about dealing with them. I actually wrote re researched and wrote the um, 2022 report for the International Federation of Journalists. Um, they do a report every year looking at reporting conditions in China. And for this, I both drew from a survey the Foreign Correspondents Club of China does every year of its members. It has about 200 members. And I also personally interviewed 20, 20 22 more journalists in different media from different countries with different lengths of experience in China. Almost all of them said that these increased restrictions really cut into how well they could report in China and importantly, reduce the rigor and nuance of their stories. So the narratives that were being shared outside of China didn't have the richness, didn't have the complexity, didn't reflect what China really is like, what we know it to be from having lived there um, to outside audiences, the way that earlier reporting, even a decade earlier, had been able to do. So all of this contributes to the stories that Americans do or don't hear about China and the narratives and beliefs that form as a result. Um, of course, things have also changed on the ground. Facts on the ground have changed under Xi Jinping. And we've heard about that from both um, Robert and David um, in terms of domestic policy, of China's relationship with the United States, and in China's actions globally. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is now called the Global Development Initiative, aims to bring most of the world's countries into a network of global trade and investment with China as a leader, if not exactly at the center, but you know, you could argue that either way. Um, I did a nine part podcast on this on China's new Silk Road. Um, and I found it very interesting reporting in a dozen countries for this podcast, how varied the answers were in terms of how people felt about China's impact on their lives, um, the Chinese investment that they were seeing and other actions by the Chinese government and, and Chinese entities in their country. Um, it, it was a good reminder for me, as though I needed one, of how important it is to do on the ground reporting and research and to have on the ground experience that allows you to see how complicated some of these issues and dynamics sometimes can be. Um, so um, a decade or two ago, that was going, that was happening not just for the journalists who covered China, but also um, with far more American students, academics, diplomats, business people, and tourists spending time in China and having direct experience with Chinese people and carrying that home and sharing their experience with other Americans and helping to shape narratives in that way too. So I, I personally feel like we've really lost something in not having that much um, of an ability to go 
back and forth. There are still many Chinese, you know, hundreds of thousands, a couple hundred thousand, I think, uh, Chinese students studying in the U.S., but fewer than before, fewer Chinese tourists coming. Part of that's because of COVID, but part of that is because of the, of the tension in relations. Um, and even in this time of increased great power competition, which, as we've heard, is likely to continue indefinitely, more interaction on more levels would be better. It would help lower the temperature. It would allow more room for more than just a state-to-state -state relationship in which China's officials don't even always pick up the phone in an emergency. And they have plenty of complaints about the United States as well, as we've also heard. Track two dialogues help on this front too. Um, David has been involved in them. Our center does them. Robert has been involved in them. These are usually um, conversations, dialogues, um, discussions among people who are not currently in government, um, but who have channels on each side to their respective governments. And the ability to clear up misperceptions and to explain some things in more granular detail can actually help to avoid um, uh, hard feelings, shall we say, that could lead to, to a situation that neither side really wants. Um, I've been talking about US narratives about China, but of course there are also the stories that Chinese hear and that they tell themselves about the United States. So as Robert said, um, China in the first part of the reform and opening up era that Deng Xiaoping launched uh, in 1979, China first learned from the United States, but then from the 2008 financial crisis onward, it started to question US superiority. I, I remember being at a National People's uh, Congress press conference where then Premier Wen Jiabao said, you know, we hope you're managing our money. And <laughs> well, you know, we're a little concerned. And um, there was increasingly this narrative in China that the United States was, you know, sort of about to be in the dustbin of history. I think that turned out to be a premature call. Um, because China's media environment is different from that of the United States, many such narratives come from the Chinese government itself. Um, Xi Jinping himself has said explicitly that Chinese media should serve the Communist Party and its interests. And so under his, uh, in, in his in the era when he's been Communist Party chief and president, journalists have increasingly brought, been brought into line uh, under, you know, with, with that in mind and those who don't, uh, toe the line usually face, you know, either being fired or, or possibly even worse. Um, she has also increasingly, or has also repeatedly said that China faces once in a century opportunities regarding a shift in power in terms of great power presence and dominance. Um, he has made it clear in his own statements that he believes that now is China's time, that China is regaining what he sees as its rightful place in the world, if not as the world leader. Um, and that this is all part of what he calls China's national rejuvenation. This is a narrative too, and it's one that Chinese people hear often. Meanwhile, Chinese, China's state-run media, as I, as I said, are no longer as free as they were when I lived in China um, to diverge from the party line. They, and, and the party line is, is at the moment quite critical of the United States. And so it contributes to the perceptions that Chinese people have of the United States and of Americans. Though I will say, that with the hundreds of thousands of Chinese who have studied in the United States, the millions who have visited, and the hundreds of millions who have absorbed US culture through movies, music, and more, they have a lot more to draw on when forming their opinions of America writ large, as opposed to just US government policy, uh, than many Americans do about Chinese and China. Um, I don't know of too many who pay attention to Chinese movies, music, books, et cetera, um, and even if they did, many of these now go through increasingly stringent censorship. So those um, reflections of culture don't necessarily reflect all that someone would experience on the ground in China even today. So here we are, the United States and China, with far less connective tissue between us than we had a decade ago, with increasingly different stories that each tells itself about the other and about our relationship. This contributes to what is already a dangerous moment as these great powers contend and will continue to contend. So what can we do? Especially what can you as teachers do? Um, I would suggest that one thing is to remember and pass along to your students the, under the understanding that China is not just the Communist Party and it's certainly not just Xi Jinping. Uh, 
It's a country of 1.4 billion people, each with his or her own hopes and dreams, understandings and misunderstandings, and stories they tell themselves about themselves, about China and its place in the world, and about us, Americans and the United States, just as we do about them, just as each American has hopes and dreams, understandings and misunderstandings, and stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about our country and its place in the world, and about China. With that, I'd like to um, start our conversation, Robert and David, with a question that um, came in, I believe, from a teacher, and that is, how do we uh, explain the Chinese per perspective to American students without sounding like we're speaking for the Chinese government? Um, how would each of you answer that? Let me start with you, uh, David. Well, <clears throat> I think it's a great question. Um, and, you know, I think there is an unfortunate tendency in the United States today, and we've seen it develop over the last several years to, you know, question the patriotism or the, um, you know, the commitment to American values of anyone who would dare try to look at China, you know, through a prism other than the generally accepted conventional prism that comes out of Washington, D.C. And it has shut down and had a chilling effect, a significant chilling effect for many, not for all, but for many in this country when it comes to articulating viewpoints about China or trying to ex explain things about China, et cetera. What the, the formula that I've found that I think works best for me and that I think is effective is, uh, as I talk about China, is to say, look, here's an issue, whether it's Taiwan or the South China Sea or human rights, here's what the United States has to say. Here's what China has to say. Here's what I see as someone who has an independent view. I'm an American citizen. Like Robert, I've sworn, I've sworn a constitutional oath to protect and defend the Constitution. When I was a Foreign Service officer, I consider that oath to continue to be binding. Um, but I have my views. And there are instances where I feel it's uh, important to express criticism of certain Chinese uh, policies and actions. And there are cases where I uh, express criticism of certain US uh, policies and actions. And I try to do it on a factual basis and on a level even keeled basis so that it's not just about grandstanding, it's not just about scoring points, but it's just about saying, look, here's what I see and I'm operating in good faith and I understand what the US position is, I understand what the Chinese position is and I'll reflect both of them accurately and then I'll tell you what I really think. And I think um, that triangular approach of laying out the positions of both sides and then in good faith saying what you think and rooting that, uh, grounding that in the in factual reality uh, and being fair-minded and acknowledging when um, the criticism that we're leveling against China may happen to also apply to the United States or vice versa. I think that's what makes a person credible when navigating this very tricky terrain. Great. Robert, how about you? How, how, how do you suggest to teachers that they explain the Chinese perspective to American students without sounding like they're speaking for the Chinese government? Well, I think, I think you know, there are multiple perspectives. So reject the notion of the Chinese perspective. There's just, there's no such thing. Um, I think that one good way to do it is to get a broad sense of the history and culture of China. And it, here I have a specific recommendation. The third edition of the Cambridge Illustrated History of China is just out by a first-rate American scholar named Patricia Buckley Ebry. And this is masterfully done. It's very readable. It gives you culture. It gives you the arts. It gives you history, politics. And so it's a great way, and it's an easy, you know, summer read that will give you a basic groundedness um, in the whole sweep of Chinese tradition. And then secondly, I would say just, you know, learn Chinese stories rather than saying these are Chinese points of view. You know, tell Chinese folk tales. What a treasure trove, you know, there, there is there. And just draw people in with those. And what that does, in my experience, and I do a lot of lecturing in, in you know, first graders, kindergartners. I go in, they're not lectures, they're interactive exercises. It should just give them an appreciation for the, the equal humanity of the Chinese. And then forget about points of view, right? Who cares about points of view? The, the big thing is that they understand that these are people like the two of you. I have, and I will send it 
to the 1990 Institute, I put together a list of what I call the China Bookshelf. It's 100 books for American students K through high school about China that walk you through at each grade level where I think the best library is. And just let them discover the stories is the way that I would come at it. I'll send it to the 1990 Institute. Great. Um, we have a question of, is the US or China more responsible for the new Cold War? Who wants to take that one? I'll take a very short answer with it. I think you'll, I was very careful not to cast blame on this. I would say that it's 70% structural, historical, and inevitable. Some version of this was always headed our way. And then if we must speak of blame, I'm happy to split the other 30% down the middle, 15%, 15%. Although the single biggest change was the change that Xi Jinping has affected in China, um, which has exacerbated our fears, the fears that David spoke about. Yeah. Um, there's also a question, David, about how um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is affecting uh, China's views, um, I think, on, on Taiwan, but also China's views in general uh, related to how it projects power in the world, in the, certainly in its region. Um, what are your thoughts on that, given your background both in China and Russia? Yeah, um, well, uh, in response to that question, I would say that um, I don't think, in short, I don't think that the Russia-Ukraine situation fundamentally alters the calculus of the Chinese leadership with respect to Taiwan. Um, I think uh, every day that we wake up and don't see a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is a day that evidently the Chinese leadership believe and have concluded that the costs of doing that outweigh the benefits. If that weren't the case, then they would do it. If they thought the benefits outweighed the costs, they would do it. Um, but I think they believe, and I think correctly, that the costs would outweigh the benefits of even attempting that. And I don't think anything that's happened in terms of Russia-Ukraine fundamentally changes that calculus. If anything, I think it reinforces the calculus because I think it sees the degree of marginalization of Russia and kind of relegating of Russia to a pariah state status. And this is even short of direct uh, military confrontation or conflict with NATO per se. Uh, obviously, NATO and the United States uh, itself have refrained from engaging Russia in a direct military conflict as a matter of policy. We just have not chosen to do that. But even so, the costs of what Russia has done and its unprovoked, unjustified, unlawful, and deplorable invasion of Ukraine, uh, those costs are very high. And uh, I don't think it changes China's fundamental calculus. I will say the last point I would make on this one, um, Mary Kay, is that you know I think it puts China in a very difficult and tenuous position because one of the things China has been very consistent about uh, over the last several decades is its emphasis on the notion of sovereignty and territorial integrity being fundamental procedural principles and part of the so-called five principles of peaceful coexistence that China has held high. Uh, and I think generally very uh, consistently from its vantage, until now, because now you have a UN member state invading unlawfully a fellow UN member state and China is clearly unwilling to level any criticism of it and arguably is in some ways supportive seemingly of the narrative that Russia articulates as justification. So I think it's been bad news for China, but I don't think it changes the calculus on Taiwan. Okay, Robert, did you wanna add anything? No, let's move on to the next question. I'm broadly in agreement with David on all those points. Okay, great. So there's a question that basically boils down to how much is decoupling a thing and how much is it overblown? Um, that basically there's interest in, in, I mean, none of us have a crystal ball and none, none of us are economists per se, but the question is what might happen over the next five to 10 years of, e of China US economic relations since many US businesses and manufacturers are moving out of China or adopting a China plus one strategy? Well. China and the United States are both decoupling selectively and have been for a long time. There are also a number of industries in which China never coupled in the first place. So it, it began with preemptive decoupling. Uh, and so th though that is likely to expand and deepen at the same time, our trade volume with China and our trade deficit with China are greater than ever. So decoupling can't be complete. Uh, there's a, an American um, 
a guy named uh, Dan Rosen, who runs the Rhodium Group up in New York. The way that he puts it is that couple decoupling should be, is some of it is inevitable, but it should be peaceful, partial, and provisional, meaning that it can be rolled back mm -hmm. if need be. But because we do have real and growing security challenges vis-a-vis -vis China, we will continue to see some decoupling. But short of war, it's not going to be that there's a massive pullout of the sort that we saw in Russia. So what's the difference between partial decoupling and de-risking, or is it just two different terms? I think that de-risking is, is a, a rather silly term, and I don't think we'll be using it a year from now. I was actually in at a conference in Hamburg when uh, Christina von der Leyen used this term. Everybody was so worried about decoupling. And she said, well, it's not decoupling, it's de-risking. said, oh, thank heavens, it's de-risking. Yeah, no one knows what this means. Uh, it was just sort of a way of saying that we realize what all the dangers of this are, and we're not going to do that dangerous thing, and somehow it'll work out. Now, there are more specific articulations of what de-risking means, but it doesn't really change anything. It's just a slightly more digestible term to us, a term which China wholly rejects because it implies that China is a risk, even though China is, in fact, mm -hmm. making the same moves. Uh, Mary Kay, if I could just add uh, very briefly to the really good points that Robert made. Um, yes, I think it's a difference of degree and it's different packaging. Uh, I know that Chinese tend to view it as the same thing, uh, but I think there's the, the, the articulation of a concept of de-risking is an effort to say that we need to be more selective and careful about the decisions that we make. But I want to just amplify a point that Robert made that I think is very important. You know, five years into the so-called trade war, and the Trump tariffs, which are now the Trump-Biden tariffs, um, the fact is uh, U.S.-China bilateral trade reached an all-time high in the year 2022. And what it tells me is that there's a lot of Washington talk about decoupling, de-risking, and so on and so forth. But the consuming publics in both countries seem to want to continue to buy stuff from each other. And uh, you don't get to the all-time record level of trade volume, as we did last year, despite all the tariffs and so on and so forth, unless there is an appetite among the consuming publics uh, to do that. And so I see some daylight between where Washington think is on this issue and where the American business community and the American consuming community is. And I think that's true in China as well. The other brief point I would just make as a tangent to this is, you know, one of the points that I've made about the U.S.-China trade relationship in recent years is, if we want China to buy more of our stuff, it may be a good idea not to excoriate them and rip them to shreds with every single statement that we make out of Washington. Um, because when you do that, um, it's hard to imagine getting to the next level. We're at a good level, you know, record level of two-way trade. But if you want to put a dent in the deficit for those who care about that particular issue, the way to do it is to you know, uh, create an atmosphere that makes people in China feel good about buying American goods and services. So sometimes we work at cross purposes to our own objectives. So, yeah, um, it, that brings up uh, sort of a big picture question, which is, OK, we're at the place that we are right now with with our relationship in our relationship. I think we all, we've all agreed that um, we see this as a secular shift in terms of the competition between the great powers and the US wants to be number one and China doesn't want to be number two. We're living with that. How could we live with it better? How could we, I mean, can we build a level, rebuild a level of some kind of trust? Is that not even really the goal? Is it something else? I mean, just how can we improve this? And I, this is a question for both of you. Robert, do you want to go first? <laughs> Oops. You're, so you, go, you go ahead, David. You touched on this in your initial comments. Why don't you go first? Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you. And, you know, it's a great question. It's really the question, uh, Mary Kay. I think it's the central question for those of us, uh, many of us who care about this relationship and understand how important this relationship is to our nation and our future. Um, you know, I, I think there are any number of things that we can do, but I'm not overly optimistic um, that we're going to be able to fundamentally change the way that we in the United States think about China because of the pounding home of a message about China as enemy that has been driven home to many Americans over to, to the great majority of the nation uh, over the last six to eight years. 
Um, I think we have to tone down our rhetoric. I think we have to be more surgical about thinking about our interests. I think we have to focus on enhancing our own competitive capabilities rather than trying to drag China down. I often point out that it's like we're we're in a sprint, the 100-yard dash, we're in lane one, China's in lane two, and we're sitting there in the blocks getting ready for the gun to go off. And all we think about is how can we make China run slower? Well, what we need to be thinking about is how do we make ourselves run faster? Because the only thing that we can actually control is us. And we don't do that enough. So a lot of the solutions to the China problem that we have in this country are really about us. And so I think focusing on solving problems and, um, you know, for that matter, giving the American people a sense, a, better, a greater sense of having a fair shake uh, in terms of globalization. We're now retreating as a nation from the notion of free markets, from the notion of globalization, from the notion of free trade. The things that made us the number one economy in the history of the world, we're now saying are not such good ideas. We're taking plays out of the Chinese playbook, playbook as, as far as how we uh, manage companies and ask them to be patriotic rather than focused on profits, patriotism over profits. That's out of the little red book of Mao Zedong. That's not how we've ever talked about these things. So getting back to basics, and focusing on us, which is the only thing we can actually control, is where we need to focus our efforts to get to a different and qualitatively better place in our relationship with China. Robert? Uh, I agree with those things, but I don't think it's just a question of managing a competition better. As I said, I do think that it's a Cold War and it's going to remain a Cold War. And the goal of a Cold War is to keep it cold. And so I think that one of the keys to handling this well is to recognize on both sides, and this is especially hard for China, though it's hard for us too, how bad things are, and to recognize that the goal of U.S.-China relations now, the foundation of the relationship, is to avoid war. Right. It's not to win competitions, although we should compete. And it's not to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party, as problematic as it is in an awful lot of ways. A lot of these you know, threats are real. It's to avoid war and to really make that uh, the measure of how the policy is doing. And if you say that, if you admit that the we face dire threats of conflict, and so we must avoid war, the first question that you have to ask is how can we create conditions that are conducive to peace over the long term? Question that isn't asked in Washington right now. And if you're asking that question, you get then to the second question, which is even more anathema in Washington, uh, which is how do I need to change? How can I compromise? How can there be an accommodation over the long term? Right now, there's no good answer to that, and the question isn't even being asked. So I think it's I think that we, if in some ways, things have to get worse or be recognized as worse before there's a sense of urgency and a commitment to making them better. Because right now, both sides, you know, as is often the case, um, you know, they're right about what's wrong with the other guy and wrong about what's right about themselves, right? And we're not, we don't misperceive them. We don't perceive them wholly, but the threats are real. And they see the threats they see from us, from the Chinese government's point of view are, are more or less real. So yes, the rhetoric, yes, self-strengthening. We've also got to recognize how serious this is as the United States and the Soviets did after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and Mary Kay, can I just add one point that I think is really important? I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, yeah. um, and I certainly agree with the really good points that Robert has just made. But you know, I think one of the central problems in the US framing of China today is that official Washington, and certainly the legislature, and some, I think, in the executive branch uh, over the last several years, particularly during the Trump administration, essentially frame China as Nazi Germany and frame Xi Jinping as Adolf Hitler. That's what they see when they see China. And so any notion of working with, quote unquote, China, the Xi Jinping administration, the Chinese government, what a lot of people in Washington hear because they've framed it this way is you're working with Nazi Germany and you're working with Adolf Hitler. If we frame China in that way, then there is no possibility to cooperate on areas where we have common interests or to even talk about common interests. There is nowhere to go. The only thing you can do with an Adolf Hitler and a Nazi Germany is to destroy it. And if we talk about China in that way, as many in the United States and the political class are doing, then the only logical policy response 
is the utter destruction and annihilation of this Hitler-like, according to this view, and Nazi Germany-like entity that exists in the world that is the root of all evil. And so how we talk about China has a significant and profound impact on the ideas that we that, that come to our mind in terms of how we deal with China, and as Robert rightly pointed out, how we generate a continued status quo of peace rather than warfare. We have time for one more very brief question from me, and that is, you know, Robert, I know that you uh, believe in the, the power of public diplomacy. Um, in this moment, uh, what could the U.S. do better on that front, especially given the political realities we have here, where we don't really know who's going to be, we don't know who's going to be running the government, you know, a year and a, and a half from now. Um, and so in terms of reassurance or in terms of any consistency, which the Chinese government and some Chinese people would like to see more of from the United States and not just China, but others in the world as well. Um, what, what can we do? Uh, I guess for but both of you, I would like to ask this br brief answers, but um, Robert, why don't you go first? So let's leave 2024 out of it because it's just a conceptual brick wall that we, we can't see beyond right now, although it's a very relevant question. I actually think we gave up on serious public diplomacy with China quite a long time ago. Uh, and what we need to do really, what public diplomacy is, is a continual engagement with Chinese people in a serious discussion about issues of common concern. It's not trying to convince them that we're right and they're wrong. That's not what public diplomacy is about. It's, it's about that dialogue uh, so that they can be informed. And I, I simply don't think that our government believes in it very strongly. And that's a, that's a bipartisan comment. It's not an attack on any one party. It's just, we used to take it more seriously. David and I were both involved in it and uh, we don't anymore. Yeah, and I, and I would just add, um, I, I agree. I, I think public diplomacy, I personally think public diplomacy is very important. I think exchanges are important. The more, the better. The more people going to uh, each country, um, the better. The more people learning the languages, the better, et cetera. And I think there has been a de-emphasis um, that uh, in some, you know, in some ways in recent years has been led by the United States with the cancellation or the termination of or suspension of the Fulbright program and so on, uh, Peace Corps. Um, you know, some of it we're doing, some of it China has always made difficult because of the nature of its system. But I do think public diplomacy continues to be important. And I think we um, you know, we have to recognize that the government to government relationship is one thing. The people to people relation relationship is really important. It is a foundational element of this relationship and we can't lose sight of it. And the last point I would make is as a nation, I think as we look at China going forward, we've got to be less emotional, less ideological and much more focused on our national interest. And it's in the interest of the United States to avoid war with China. It's certainly in China's interest to avoid war with us. Just as Robert said, we need to focus on advancing the national interest, which we did really well, in my judgment, over presidential administrations of both parties, dating back to Richard Nixon and through the presidency of Barack Obama. Um, I think we've just got to be more clear-headed and more level-headed as we look at this challenge and address it in a business-like way and with less emotion and less vitriol. I just noticed, by the way, that Abigail Washburn is on the call. Oh, wow. Uh, one of the great masters of public diplomacy over the past several decades. So if you have Happy any questions, her uh, ask her. Um, there, just one last uh, question that's been pulled up for me that I, I just wanted to address myself. So it says, do you think on US media, there are a lot more negative reports than positive ones on China. At the moment, yes. Mm -hmm. I think part of that comes from the fact that there's less access within China for US journalists. And that um, be, when you have less access, you focus on the things you can focus on. Also, there are a lot of people outside of China who don't even have the context that you have from being in Beijing and maybe not being able to travel as much or talk to as many people, but at least you know what things feel like on the ground. And so the more you get reports from outside with less context, the more you're going to have a, a sort of a, a distortion of um, how certain issues are actually playing out. There are also real 
issues that are happening in China that deserve critical attention, including the situation with Uyghurs who had, were detained over the course of you know, several years um, and, and otherwise um, you know, deprived of rights in, in various ways. Um, those deserve being covered. That is a fair story, if you ask me as a journalist. But that's not the only story in China. And if you're based in China and you're covering the the you know China on a daily basis, you get to a lot of different kinds of stories. So personally, I would advocate for there to be more access for journalists, Chinese journalists in the United States, U.S. journalists in China, other journalists in China. I think everyone would benefit. Um, and Susanna, back to you. Thank, first, let me say thank you very much, David and Robert, for a, a really fantastic discussion. And um, thanks to all the teachers and others who are here for your great questions. Thank you, Mary Kay. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Kay. And um, again, thank you so much to David and Robert for your insights and for staying on to further our teachers' uh, engagement uh, with additional dialogue. At this time, for my teachers still in the audience, I'd love for you to insert any question or comment that you have in the Q&A, or please raise your hand and we'll call on you uh, if you have any of these questions or comments to our esteemed speakers as it relates to how you can incorporate what you've heard today in your teaching. Um, in the coming days, uh, because I've seen this already in the Q&A, 1990 Institute will share a follow-up uh, to our workshop participants with a recording of the session, a reference page that includes curated sample lesson plans, activities, and discussion guides, as well as additional reference materials, including the books that Robert mentioned earlier. So please be on the lookout for that. So over the course of this workshop, we have heard so many remarks that touch on so many different subjects taught in grades 8 through 12, from geography, world history, uh, political science, and even extracurricular activities and clubs like journalism or speech and debate. Um, Robert, for example, provided a very detailed summation of the history of uh, U.S. and China relations, and David uplifted the fact that we need have to agree on shared definitions of understanding um, of each other rooted in truth and fact. Um, I, I want to turn quickly over to the, the panelists. Um, D David, you spoke on the gravest danger in educating youth is the untethering of public and political discourse from reality. And uh, I want to pose this for all of you here. Um, what advice do you have for our teachers? How do we do this? And what are some actionable next steps that teachers can take? Uh, because David, you brought it up. I'll start with you first. Well, thanks so much, uh, Susanna, for raising that. And uh, by the way, I think it's, I say it's the gravest challenge, not just for our students, but for our nation. I think it's the number one challenge that we face for the simple reason that if we can't speak about our public policy challenges factually, we won't be able to solve them. <laughs> so it's foundational. And we've gotten away from that. I could cite a lot of data points that illustrate that. But uh, the point that I think I would make in response to your really good question is, uh, probably the one that many of us would make, and that is, you know, I think it's important to look at a variety of sources, to be very critical about the sources of information that you're looking at, to examine both sides of, and to teach critical thinking so that all of us, students, um, right up to professionals and policymakers, can look at both sides of an argument and not be closed minded or, in, you know, uh, unable to be, to take on, take on board new information. That's a skill. I think it's a foundational skill in any democracy or really in any country uh, or society. And I think we need to, as a nation, be more diligent about teaching um, critical thinking and the ability to evaluate sources, to evaluate biases, and to take information from a number of different sources and, and, and synthesize it into uh, something that makes sense and that's factual and that we can get our arms around. That softer skill set is one that I think, uh, in some ways, I think has uh, deteriorated in the United States, arguably in recent years and decades, uh, particularly over the last uh, perhaps uh, eight years or so. But I think we need to get back to it because it's the it's ultimately the foundation for our society to be functional, let alone to be prosperous and successful. Thank you so much for that. Mary Kay or Robert, do you have any? Uh... I would add, I mean, David's talking about facts, which obviously involves student research and finding out what's out there. And I you know, hail that. 
But I come back to the point that you also need to humanize the issue constantly. And I think that film is a very, very good way to do that. And we have, for example, Lulu Wang's The Farewell, uh, Aquafina's movie, just incredible. Um, Ang Lee's Eat, Drink, Man, Woman uh, on China. And there are a number of other movies. And I think that the it, facts count, but boy, so does empathy. And I think that in general, especially for students eight through 12, uh, that's a good way to go. And if you can get them to sit through, you know, the farewell and eat, drink, man, woman, and, and sort of go deep on Chinese culture, then as a reward, they get to watch Stephen Chow's Kung Fu Hustle too. <laughs> I just strongly agree with, with uh, both Robert and David's comments, and they're completely in harmony with what I said about the importance of talking to a wide variety of people in different, I mean, it's hard for teachers and students to do that, but to draw from different sources a lot of different sources um, to be able to give as full a picture as possible of, of what China is like and Chinese, the very different people who are in China. Uh, and so then speaking to, uh, you know, Robert and Mary Kay, you both raised a, you know, a point underscoring that China is not just CCP, but, you know, 1.4 billion people with their own hopes and dreams. Um, and, and, you know, now as you're speaking about uh, films and, and art and cultural aspects uh, of, of understanding Chinese people and, and this relationship between US and China, what do you think, uh, I think this actually comes from one of our teachers, what do you think Americans most misunderstand about the daily life of ordinary Chinese people? And do you have any suggestions about sharing um, that uh, my, my students would would like to see or, or um, you know, have them understand what teen life is like in China, their counterparts. Can I jump in? How similar in some ways, at least urban Chinese life is like American life? I mean, it's it's different in some ways, but I think someone visiting would see a lot of things that they would find familiar in terms of what, kids like teenagers are, are interested in, you know, what they're paying attention to online. Um, you know, there are differences in the greater environment, but I mean, I, I found when I lived in Beijing, you know, that I, you know, I found the sense of humor to be similar. Mm -hmm. I found the work ethic to be similar. I found these, you know, strong connection to family to be similar. I know that there are some perceptions that, um, Americans are very individualistic and Chinese are very close to their families, but I have Chinese friends who are less close to their families and there are many Americans who are very close to their families. And I, I just, the dynamics were very similar. There's a lot of common ground. There's a lot um, to talk about that um, that's a bridge. David or Robert, any uh, ads there? Um, I, I would just express very strong agreement with what Mary Kay said, and that's very consistent with my experience for many years living in China and dealing with China. And there is a lot of humanity. There's a lot of commonality of experience. Obviously, the languages and cultures and contexts are different, but um, there is a narrative in this country that, you know, China is um, an absolutely, totally North Korea-like, unfree place where Nobody, you know, seemingly can do anything and so on and so forth. And, you know, as Robert very rightly pointed out uh, at the outset, uh, the expansion of individual ability to um, operate and to live life and to do the things that human beings do has, uh, that's expanded in astonishing ways uh, over the last 40, 50 years. Yes, there are still some very, you know, clear red lines and limitations, but the degree to which people can live their life and work and go on vacation and buy a house and if they can afford one, given the real estate prices, and get together and hang out with their boyfriend or girlfriend and with their family, raise their kids, play sports, all of those things, the, the, the fabric of everyday life for Americans, uh, just as Mary Kay very rightly noted, is very recognizable to Chinese and vice versa. So when we, uh, Robert's right when he points out that empathy is a really important point, point here, facts and empathy. I think that's the, that's the two-pronged strategy to, uh, to get to a better place over some period of time 
And I hope that we can get there because our future depends on it. Facts and, and empathy and, and some introspection as well. I would advise the teachers, don't shy away from the tough issues. If students want to talk about Xinjiang and the stuff they're hearing, by all means, uh, take it on. Make it be you know, fact-based, have them do research to get the facts, as David suggested. And then I would also ask them, and Xinjiang is a great example of this, as is Tibet, to say, well, you know, can you think of anything that is sort of like this? Is there anything analogous to this in any way in America or in, in any other countries? Have to some degree, don't make it too Chinese. It's always reported in that way, right? These are these are human problems. This is the human rights problem. It doesn't mean China doesn't have a big human rights problem. It does. But have them look at America's history, other countries' history, and ask, what is this like? What are the conditions under which these kinds of thing, these kinds of things are done? How have other countries that have gone through this emerged from it? Don't shy away from the tough stuff, but don't limit its context to Chinese experience, right? Broaden it out. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. I know we are at time, but I would be remiss if I, as an executive director, if I did not promote and share with uh, everyone here that 1990 Institute does have, uh, you know, a, a video, a short form video that provides an inside look into what millennial life is like in China, as well as, um, you know, our, our Gaokao video uh, that explains uh, the SAT or the ACT version of what they have um, in, in China. So uh, there are so many other questions. Unfortunately, we were not able to get to them today, but my hope is that I, we can call on Mary Kay, Robert, and David to also uh, be able to answer some of these questions offline and then share some of the, their insights and these answers into that follow-up email that we'll send out to our participants. So thank you again, everyone, um, especially Mary Kay for your dual role today to Robert and to David, uh, who is joining us while he is uh, uh, not in his home office. Um, and, and again, um, I want to hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.